In this video, I would like to go over the pathophysiology of different bone disorders and then discuss how the lab values for the serum calcium, serum phosphate, alkaline phosphatase, and parathyroid hormone will be affected in any one of these conditions. But before being able to discuss these conditions, first I would like to go over the physiology of the bone formation as well as bone structure as well as the cells and the hormones that are involved. So the bone is made of a combination of calcium calcium and phosphate that is combined with hydroxide and they would form the hydroxy apatite which is highly resistant to fractures. Now the cells that are involved in the formation of bones are osteoblasts while the cells that are involved in the destruction of the bones are osteoclasts. And it's the osteoblast that will send signals via rank L as well as the macrophage colony stimulating factor to induce the monocytes to be converted into osteoclast. An osteoclast, in order to be able to destroy the bone, they will secrete an acidic solution and acid will help destroy the calcium components and dissolve the bones. And then on the other hand, osteoblasts which are forming bone since acidic environment is destroying bones, they would require an alkaline environment to form the bone. And so alkaline phosphatase or ALP is a component that is used to determine osteoblast activity. Now one hormone that you have to be familiar with is parathyroid hormone, which will overall increase the calcium concentration of the serum and decrease the phosphate concentration of the serum. And parathyroid hormone regulates the calcium concentration via different mechanisms, including one, it stimulates the osteoblast to secrete rank L as well as macrophage colony stimulating factor to form more osteoclast. And so therefore there would be more resorption of bones. In addition, parathyroid hormone induces the activation of vitamin D and vitamin D increases the absorption of the calcium as well as phosphate from the gut. And then finally, parathyroid hormone works on the renal tubules to increase the calcium absorption in the distal convoluted tubule, but then it decreases the phosphate reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule. So overall, all of these effects combined, there would be an elevated concentration of calcium, but low concentration of phosphate in the serum after the activation of the parathyroid hormone. All right, now the first condition that I would like to discuss is osteoporosis, which is divided into three types. Type 1 is seen in postmenopausal females. Since there is low estrogen, therefore there would be more activation of osteoclast, and so there would be more resorption of bones. And these patients are particularly prone to the vertebral fractures as well as colis fractures. So they would develop vertebral compression fractures as well as collis fracture which is fracture of the distal radius. The second type of osteoporosis is called senile osteoporosis and is seen in both men and women of uh, older than 70 years of age and particularly femur as well as pelvic fractures are common. And then finally, we have another type that is called secondary osteoporosis which is from chronic steroid use conditions like Cushing's disease where there is an increased corticosteroids which causes osteoporosis is from long-term heparin use, vitamin D deficiency, immobilization, and then other causes that will lead to osteoporosis. So the bone in patients with osteoporosis are usually affecting the trabecular or spongy bone and there is a decrease in bone mass as well as interconnections. However, the mineralization of the bones is normal. So therefore the level of calcium, phosphate, alkaline phosphatase, and parathyroid hormone, everything remains normal. And so keep that in mind. The level of mineralization is normal in patients with osteoporosis. Now for the diagnosis, you can order a DEXA scan. And for DEXA scan, what you will have to do is that you take a bone sample from the hip and then compare it to the bone density of a healthy 30-year-old individual. And if there is more than 
two and a half standard deviation less in the level of bone mass in an individual, then that's a diagnosis of osteoporosis. If there is about one to 2.5 standard deviation less in the bone mass, then that would be osteopenia. So for osteoporosis, it has to be more than two and a half standard deviation for the bone mass to be less than a healthy individual. So for the prophylactic treatment of these patients, you can supply them with vitamin D, calcium, as well as weight-bearing exercises like, for instance, running, as well as hiking. So just keep that in mind that biking as well as swimming are not weight-bearing and will not help with osteoporosis. So in order to help with osteoporosis, we need weight-bearing exercises like, for instance, running and hiking. And then for the treatment, there are different medications that can be used. And these include, for instance, selective estrogen receptor modulators, like, for instance, raloxifene. And what these medications do is that they act as estrogen agonists in the bone and thus interfere with activation of the osteoclast. And so there would be less resorption of the bone. Other medications include, for instance, calcitonin. And calcitonin is naturally being produced by the parafollicular C cells of the thyroid and they inhibit the function of the osteoclast. The other medications that can be used are, for instance, bisphosphonate like for instance, alendronate. And what this medication does is that it binds to the hydroxy appetite and thus it will interfere with the function of the osteoclast and so it will interfere with the breakdown of the bone. And then at the same time, you must also be aware of the side effects of alendronate, which include the erosive esophagitis as well as jaw necrosis. Finally, you should know that the pulsatile parathyroid hormone is also used for the treatment of osteoporosis. So not continuous, but rather pulsatile form of parathyroid hormone is also helping with the conservation of the bone. The next condition is osteopetrosis, also known as marble bone disease where there is a defect in the carbonic anhydrase, which is required for the production of acid to be able to break down the bones. And so since the osteoclast cannot provide any more acidic environment, therefore there would be difficulty with the function of osteoclast as a consequence of which there would be decreased resorption of bones. And so therefore there would be a thick bones. And here on the x-ray, you will see that there is a very thick bones, like there is hyperdensity on the x-ray. So therefore these patients will have thick, dense bones. And so since the bones keep on growing, there would be less space for the bone marrow. So these patients will usually have anemia as a consequence of which there would be extra medullary hematopoiesis, so therefore the body will start making now hemoglobin inside the liver since there is not enough space in the bone marrow to make the blood. There is also more fractures since there is problem with the remodeling of the bones and then since the, again there is an increase in size of the bones there is impingement on the cranial nerves which can cause a narrowing of the foramina. And so since in these patients the problem is with the osteoclast, therefore bone marrow transplantation is curative since now you can have a normal osteoclast that will help with the remodeling and resorption of the bones. Now in terms of the lab values, everything remains normal, calcium phosphate, alkaline phosphatase, and parathyroid hormone, but then depending on the age of the individual and in the other conditions, there could be also a decrease in the level of calcium as well as elevated level of alkaline phosphatase. So these two values, the calcium and alp, could be variable from normal to increase for ALP and from normal to decrease for calcium. The next condition is Paget's disease, also known as osteoidis deformans, where there is an increased activity of both the osteoblasts as well as osteoclasts, as a consequence of which there is a mosaic woven bone pattern. And then the complications that may arise in these patients is heart failure since there is a formation of the arteriovenous shunts which leads to the high output cardiac failure. And then there could be also increased risk of osteogenic sarcoma. And then the common complaints that you may hear about this disorder is that there is an increased heart size 
and then due to the narrowing of the auditory foramen, there is also hearing loss associated with this disorder. So keep in mind, Paget's disease complications include the high output cardiac failure due to the AV shunts formation. There is an increased risk of osteogenesis sarcoma, and then patients usually complain of increased hat size as well as hearing difficulty due to the narrowing of the auditory foramen. Now in terms of the lab values, everything is normal except for elevated level of alkaline phosphatase due to the increased osteoblastic activity. So the memory aid that I have for you is that pigeons on Alps mountains. So alkaline phosphatase is the only factor that is elevated in patients with the Paget's disease. So patients on Alps mountains. The next condition is chronic renal failure where there is problem with the formation of Calci triol which is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And so since there is low level of vitamin D, therefore there would be low level of calcium in these patients. So since there is low level of calcium, the body will start to secrete the parathyroid hormone to compensate for low level of calcium. So there would be more parathyroid hormone production. At the same time, since the uh, kidney cannot get rid of the phosphate, the level of phosphate will keep on accumulating in the serum. And then there is no changes in the level of the alkaline phosphatase because the level of osteoblast activity is not affected. So again, the level of calcium is decreased while the level of phosphate and parathyroid hormone are increased. Now for the same reason that phosphate cannot get excreted because kidneys have problem, similarly potassium and uh, acids can no longer get excreted in these patients. So there is also elevated level of potassium and elevated level of the hydrogen ion. So these patients will have metabolic acidosis as well as hyperkalemia in addition to hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. Next we have the osteomalacia and rickets, both of which are due to the deficiency of vitamin D. So osteomalacia is in adults while rickets is from vitamin D deficiency in children. Now characteristics of children with rickets include bowing of arms due to decreased mineralization of the osteoid matrix as well as rachitic rosary due to abnormal deposition of osteoids. And so since there is low level of vitamin D therefore there would be decreased absorption of both the calcium and phosphate. So both the level of calcium and phosphate are decreased in these patients but then there would be an elevated level of parathyroid hormone to help compensate for low level of calcium. And then in these patients also the level of alkaline phosphatase activity is elevated. The next condition is primary hyperparathyroidism where there is an elevated level of parathyroid hormone as a consequence of which there would be more calcium and less phosphate in the serum. Now since parathyroid hormone activates the vitamin D and also it can act on the osteoblast to um, regulate the level of rank L secretion for instance, therefore the level of osteoblast activity will be elevated and so therefore there would be an elevated alkaline phosphatase in these patients. But overall, despite increased absorption of vitamin D, parathyroid hormone causes more bone resorption than bone formation, despite there is an elevated level of ALF, so just keep that in mind. And then the other term that is used for the description of the primary hyperparathyroidism is osteitis fibrosa cystica and this is due to the fact that from bone resorption so parathyroid hormone causes more bone resorption there is a consequent fibrous replacement of the marrow which causes formation of a cystic spaces inside the bone so therefore the other name for primary hyperparathyroidism is osteitis fibrosa cystica the next condition is hypoparathyroidism. So since there is low level of the parathyroid hormone, therefore there would be a low level of calcium and high level of phosphate. And then the level of ALP remains normal. And then pseudo hypoparathyroidism is a condition where the kidneys do not respond to the parathyroid hormone. And the other name for pseudo hypoparathyroidism is Albright's hereditary osteo dystrophy, which is an autosomal dominant disorder. And so in these patients, since the kidneys do not respond to the parathyroid hormone, again there would be low level of calcium and high level of phosphate. So since the body notices that there is low level of calcium, it would keep on increasing the secretion of the parathyroid hormone, but since it doesn't work on the kidneys, it doesn't help with the increasing level of the calcium 
or decreasing the level of phosphate. And then the level of alkaline phosphatase remains normal in these patients. And then one other feature of pseudohypoparathyroidism is that these patients have shortened fourth and fifth digits of their hands. So in addition to these lab changes, there is also shortened fourth and fifth digits of the hands. All right, now next I would like to discuss how any one of conditions that are listed above fall in this graph. So here we have a normal concentration of calcium and normal concentration of parathyroid hormone, and this is the normal range. So what conditions are associated with the elevated level of calcium and elevated level of parathyroid hormone? So here, is from the primary hyperparathyroidism as a consequence of which there is an elevated level of parathyroid hormone and elevated level of calcium. On the other hand, if there is excess calcium intake, which is independent of the parathyroid hormone, the level of parathyroid hormone remains low, but since the patient is taking excess calcium intake, Therefore, the level of calcium will be elevated independent of elevation in the parathyroid hormone. Now, what condition is associated with low level of calcium and high level of parathyroid hormone? An example of which is pseudo hypo parathyroidism. As a consequence of which, there is an elevated level of parathyroid hormone, but since the kidneys do not respond to the parathyroid hormone, the level of calcium remains low. Another example where there is an elevated level of parathyroid hormone, but since there is low secretion of vitamin D as a consequence of which the level of calcium remains low, is chronic renal failure. So just keep that in mind. Patients with pseudohypoparathyroidism and chronic renal failure have the same lab findings in terms of the high level of parathyroid hormone, but low level of calcium. And then the final condition is where we have low level of parathyroid hormone and low level of calcium. And that's easy. And that is from hypo parathyroidism. So since there is low level of parathyroid hormone, there is also low level of calcium. And that concludes our discussion of the bone disorders.